not going to belabor or repeat any point. And I assure you that. But I am going to make five submissions. My submissions have been substituted, as my Lord knows that this is a different act. So these submissions are with regard to writ petition civil 1141 of 2022, Ms. Aditi Anand and others versus Union of India challenging the Special Marriage Act. I also appear, my lords, today for DCPCR, the Delhi Commission on the Protection of Ch Children's Rights. And their IA is 71983. Now, I will make five distinct points on the writ petition, and I will make two very short submissions on DCPCR's intervention. My lords, have my substituted submissions, my lord? Yes. yes. So this will do instead of the... Yes, my lords. It is, it's a substitution. It's not an ancillary. It's a substitution. Yes, you got it. There are long annexures because we did not have benefit of the compilation since this yes. is a substitution. My lords, my five distinct points are one, this. Contrary to what the union has advanced in its counter and in its opposition in court, India's parliament, in India, the parliamentary form of government that we adopted as we the people when the constitution was adopted, unlike England, is a constrained parliamentary form. In England, parliament is sovereign. In India, simply put, parliament is constrained. Constrained by what? Constrained by the constitution as interpreted by whom? Your, my lords. That is the separation of powers formula that we the people gave ourselves. So to say that this is a matter for parliament is not just unknown to the Indian parliamentary form, which is constrained by the constitution, but in fact seeks to impose a British parliamentary model, which has no place in this jurisdiction. That is point one, my lords. I'll very briefly take you to two extracts. One, pre Keshavananda, Delhi Laws Act, very brief extract, my lords. And one, post Keshavananda. <laughs> Subcommittee yeah. on Judicial Accountability. Everything is in the submissions, my lords. I will not trouble you with the compilation. I will take you only to those extracts. Second point, my lord. Yes. Judicial review is part of basic structure. Of course, my lords, it's well established. Mm -hmm. Kesavananda, Minerva Mills, so on and so forth. Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly debate says Article 32 is the soul of India's constitution. Why is this important? Because we, these petitioners in 19 petitions, speaking for, if arguably, 5 to 7 percent of any country's population identifies as LGBTQ, then speaking on behalf of millions of Indians, come to my lords to say this and this alone, that our Article 32 rights are violated. And as my Lord, the Chief Justice said, most importantly in this preamble, that we the people gave ourselves, the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens, that's 32. So the government of India cannot come to court and say that we the people, and we may be a minority or a substantial part of this population, cannot come to court and say that this is a matter of parliament because our Article 32 rights, the right of judicial review, 
is part of the basic structure of this constitution, of which this basic structure doctrine we have now celebrated five decades. Those five decades belong to LGBTQ people also. My Lord's point three, and again, I will only take my Lord to this specific paragraph. What is the point two? My Lord's point two is Article 32. All right, that's all. Yes, my Lord's. It's point two, and I'll take my Lord's. That's also the second point of the written submissions, my Lord's. My Lord's have the index, so I won't trouble my Lord's with repeating any points that have been dealt with. My Lady Justice Kohli has the index also, my Lady. Yes. I'm grateful. Point three, my Lord. The union in its counter has said to us, that they have a legitimate state interest in proscribing this nature of marriage. My lords, the Chief Justice, nine judges in Puttuswami, have interpreted legitimate state interest as specifically pertaining to national security, crime, innovation, and dissipation, prohibiting dissipation of social welfare benefits. That is the understanding of when can the state ascribe and highlight such legitimate state interest. This is point three. Nowhere in these cases, in these petitions, does the state meet that heightened requirement. I'll take my lords to the two relevant paragraphs there, which are also in my written submissions. That is point three. Point four, my lords, in response to earlier questions on day one and day two, we discussed that marriage was a bouquet of rights. And what is that bouquet of rights? The table of benefits, my lords. Very briefly, I'll discuss that. It's part of the written submission, so I won't belabor it. But these benefits include gratuity, provident fund, and my lords, dare I say, pension of judges including Supreme Court judges, are all premised on the understanding of one thing and one thing alone, a spousal relationship created by marriage. We are excluded from all of that. That is my table of benefits at page 35 of the written submissions. That is point four. Point five, my lord. That marriage is a matter of conscience under Article 25 of the Constitution of India. Now, my lords have heard arguments on Article 14, 15, 19, 21. They are all extracted in my submissions. I adopt my comrades at the bar who've advanced those arguments. I'm not going to repeat them. They're part of my written submissions. But marriage is also a matter of conscience under Article 25 of the Constitution. And that is my point five. Finally, my lords, there is a workability table. I will not trouble my lords, but just to say that it is part of the submissions. But the final point I want to say, and I will come back to this also when I deal with the submissions of the statutory body that is DCPCR, is that our annexure six in my submissions is the only study that is based in India. It has 5,800 respondents, and the study speaks to one, the journey post Johar, how it has impacted LGBTQ people, and two, how marriage equality will impact LGBTQ people. And that is a substantial portion of the annexure that is part of these written submissions. I couldn't put it in the compilation because at that time I was on a different brief. <laughs> and of course, my Lodge knows that the Indian Psychiatric Society has also released a statement commending marriage equality. My Lodge, may I first take you very briefly to the first submission, my lords. And I will only read very specific paragraphs, and I will not trouble my lords beyond that. That the Indian parliament is a creature of the constitution and does not enjoy unfettered sovereignty. 
May I only take you to one paragraph, my lord? And this is, my lords, as part of my written submission, page six, para 11. Just page six, my lord. Just one paragraph of my submissions. My lords have parallel. Yes. My lords. yes. I'm just going to read from the middle of this paragraph. This is what your lordships in a seven judge bench of this honorable court in Delhi Laws Act 1912. My lord, just this call has the submissions, my lord. Yes. yes. We are yes. Thank you, my lords. In the middle of this paragraph, para 12, this is how your lordships and seven judges in 1951 distinguish India's parliament from that of Britain. My lords say, the Indian parliament is a creature of the constitution. Its powers, rights, privileges, and obligations have to be found in the relevant articles of the constitution. It is not a sovereign body, uncontrolled with unlimited powers. The constitution of India has conferred on the Indian parliament powers to make laws in respects of matters specified in appropriate places. The following sentence, and it is constrained in particular by articles found in part three dealing with fundamental rights. But Ms. Uh, Dr. Guruswami. Yes, my lord. The point really is that the fact that the canvas which is covered by these petitions also falls within the, or does fall, let me not say also, does fall within the domain of parliament is undisputed. Uh, you cannot dispute the fact that Parliament has legislative power over the canvas which is covered by these petitions, which is entry 5 of the concurrent list. My Lord. Because just let's see entry 5 of the concurrent list of the Constitution. Yes, Lord. It specifically covers marriage and divorce, infants and minors, adoption, Yes, ma'am. Wills, interstice and succession, joint family and partition, all matters in respect of which parties and judicial proceedings were immediately before the commencement of the constitution subject to their personal law. My lord. Right? Therefore, uh, entry 5 also recognizes the position that all matters which prior to the constitution were a part of the personal law fall now within the domain of parliament under entry 5 of list 3. Therefore, we, there's no gainsaying the fact that Parliament does have. So, for us to say that, you know, uh, to accept the submission of the Union would be to transplant the British parliamentary model may not be entirely correct. You are right that the British Parliament, at least before the, uh, before the uh, Human Rights Act, yes. was untrammeled. It was a sovereign, uh, it was an expression of the sovereign will yes. of the people. And therefore, judicial review couldn't certainly extend to a striking down a law. Even today, you have the doctrine of incompatibility. But equi equally, uh, that really begs the question because our parliament has specific jurisdiction legis in legislative terms uh, by virtue of Article 4, 246, read with entry 5 of List 3, My Lord. to legislate on this area. My Lord. Now, the question which we really therefore have to pose is that uh, if this is a power which is conferred specifically on the parliament, does the court then, where does the court really exercise jurisdiction? Very which well. are those interstices which are left open for the court to uh, exercise its powers? I, I don't think you can take it that far to say that, you know, uh, as you have said in your first point, that uh, that to say that this is a matter for Parliament seeks to impose a British Parliament reform. That may be a very, you know, it may not be really a very correct way of stating it. My Lords, may I, may I respond with this, my Lords? The argument, my Lords, is simply this. That in these areas where there has been legislation, the Special Marriage Act, for instance, in these areas where there has been legislation, the Special Marriage Act, read in conjunction with well-established case law by my lords, both this nature of case, what is the function, what is the width and ambit of parliament, along with cases like Puttuswami and Johar, which my lords have made clear that fundamental rights cannot be trammeled. The argument is simply this, that these have to be read conjo conjointly. 
that we cannot have a situation where the state, when it is remiss, either in discussing something, in creating that positive obligation that my lords have spoken about, both in Puttaswami and in Johar. Dr. Guruswami, my lords, just, yes, my on, lord, the just same note, as on the same note, when you're casting a positive obligation yes. on the lawmakers, just go back to the point of time of article, look at article 17. It says right. accessibility is forbidden and it's an offense. It yes. opposes the creation of a law. And the first law that we had was in Civil Rights Act 1955. My Lord. You're aware of that? Yes, my Lord. But it was felt to be inadequate. What did the court do? Did the court step in and say this is wrong? According to you, it can. That's one situation. We are in a situation where there is no law, there is no Civil Rights Act, and something as assertive, as positive as 17, if we were to be enforced, how would the court deal with it? We are one step ahead and one step backward also. If it is forbidden and it's an offense, and to be an offense, you need a law. I, fo are, you understand that. I, Therefore, I, I follow horizontal right I, as well yes so there is, there is a concomitant you know both things are to go together that right has to be translated into law and you can't have a wider right than that to my mind there is no right other than article 17 which is cast in the in the most absolute terms and yet mm -hmm. that depended because you are dealing with an offense that de depended upon the lawmaker left it to the lawmaker to lay out the conditions in which an offense could be created because after all then you're dealing with someone else's life liberties right yes. so therefore that legislative vacuum had to be addressed by parliament through an enact so we are almost at that situation if but with not such a wide right it's a derivative right as of now because of a, a kind of seamless web which you are trying to expound that the judgments of the court starting with decriminalization a general right of privacy you're stitching it all and saying that there is a an organic growth which means that we have a right to marry therefore there there is need for recognition my lords i follow and i'm grateful justice but i'm grateful my lords if we read article 17 if i may if I may, with your permission. Untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. The enforcement of any disability arising out of untouchability shall be an offense punishable in accordance with law. So the text of the constitution and the drafters made it incumbent upon the legislature to have an enactment, an act of parliament that would in fact make this an implementable criminal offense yeah, even without that you could have had it even God. without that you could even yeah. without those in the absence of that term it was still possible for parliament to enact it but why did they have it they cast an obligation therefore there are different kinds of rights in the fundamental rights chapter now, what you are saying is something which is now recognized as a right necessarily has to be translated into law. That is where I think the Chief Justice's question is very important. My Unless we create an obligation, because short of an obligation of that kind, how do we, how do we weave out an obligation or a mandate my lords, my respect. Now take Puttaswami itself. Puttaswami really arose in the context of Aadhaar. When the Aadhaar challenge was laid before our court, yes, my lords. Then Attorney General Mr. Rodgi argued that there is no right to privacy, based on a judgment of the court, our court, which had held that there is no uh, right to privacy. But then there were views, say, in Khadak Singh and following cases, which said that there is a right to privacy. When Puttaswami came before the court, specifically in the context of informational privacy, 
which was really the backdrop to Putta Swami. The concluding part of the judgment says that we would expect that Parliament should come out with a draft bill or, or, or a law on privacy. By then, you know, some some steps had been taken because the Shri Krishna Commission had been the Shri Krishna Committee had been constituted. We took note of what had been done by Parliament, namely the constitution of the Shri Krishna Committee. Obviously, we couldn't issue a, ma a mandamus to the uh, legislature. And then we said that this is what we have been assured. So even in the context of privacy, the, the thing is that these rights the court has contemplated have to be fleshed out by the, by the legislature. There are cases, of course, Vishakha is the classical example where the court has laid down a framework pending the legislature stepping in and, uh, and creating uh, a law specifically on, on, on the safety of women in the workplace. But the test really is this, how far does the court go? Because as your submission, and this is something which counsel which follow you, who should also, also address us, all your submissions willy-nilly would have some bearing on how we understand the impact of our decision as you want it to be albeit in the context of the Special Marriage Act on issues which will relate to personal law. Because there is no doubt about the fact that, you know, adoption, succession, interstice, these are all matters which are governed by the personal law even today. My Lord, it's adoption today Apart is from by the Juvenile Justice Act, my Lord. It's also by the high, civil but law. The, but you also have the Hindu succession and adoptions, uh, the Hindu Adoptions and Maintenance Act. You do, my lords, but the now the legislative mandate for adoption in general is the coverage of the Juvenile Justice Act, which was adopted more recently. It is a civil law and it <laughs> cuts across the, communities. The, it cuts yeah, across religious. My that, lords. that is true because for the longest time there was a problem in enacting a law, a temp, you know, a, a, a general law. But let's not also undermine the Hindu Adoptions and Maintenance Act because apart from juvenile justice which you would now refer that is also one of the laws and that does lay out certain conditions and that would come on those who are uh, of that of that um, you know faith yes and likewise um, there is no other law other than the the 2016 act there is no other law my lord sir may i now answer these questions serial wise my lords if i may First, my Lord Justice Bhatt, respectfully, my Lords, my assessment, my Lords, and, and it is far more limited uh, than, than my Lord's assessment. My assessment of Article 17 is that it mandates that the legislature create law to convert Article 17 into an implementable criminal offense. Hence the language in Article 17, the text of the Constitution saying, punishable in accordance with law. Correct. And similarly, my lords, may I just add this, similarly, 21A, when I was, my lords, and this was perhaps the first constitutional, big constitutional rights case I argued, the Right to Education Act, Article 21A, and we were before then Chief Justice Kapadia. And one of the points that Justice Kapadia made to me was that even pre-21A, even pre the legislative enactment, the courts had been actively involved in implementing and enforcing this right to education. And he took us through case law. He said, you see, this, 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 21A and the legislative intent only comes later. My lords have been that North Star not just for LGBTQ rights. My lords have been that North Star in many facets of fundamental rights, pre the legislature walking the talk. So we don't ask for anything that special today, with respect. We only ask for a workable interpretation, my lords, of the Special Marriage Act. And council after council, council after council, have presented workability tables to my lords, as have I. 
if it is a question of reading spouse instead of husband or wife, that is one option. If it is a question of expanding the definition and reading in a constitutionally tenable technique, that is an option. If it is a question of taking from 13 of the General Clauses Act, where male includes female, that is an option. We have interpretive options available to this August Constitutional Court. We only ask for a constitutionally tenable interpretation per Puttuswami, per Johar, pre Keshavananda, post Keshavananda, including Keshavananda. That's what we ask. For our basic structure is also intertwined with Keshava and Minerva and what follows after that. That is the purpose of point number one. We are not that discreet, that distinct, that devoid of basic structure that we will not be read into Minerva, Keshava and the cases that follow. We are part of we the people and we are citizens of this country. Basic structure also belongs to us. 32 is also our soul. And parliament cannot be the reason to exclude us from this gamut of our constitution. Now, my lords, may I just take my lords to page 12 of my submissions? My lords, this is paragraph 23, where the preamble is extracted. And I just wanted to end on this point, which my lord, the Chief Justice, had alluded to on day one. Paragraph 24. The right to move this court for enforcement of fundamental rights under 32 gives effect to the phrase to secure to all its citizens. That parliament is a creature of the constitution and is bound by it. And within these submissions, my lord, and I'm not going to belabor this, but if my lords just turns to page 14 of the submissions, and this is from, as my Lord said, Puttu Swami, which originates from Aadhaar, but makes a very important point of constitutional principle. Whether it's with privacy or whether it's with Aadhaar, but it is a point of constitutional principle that nine judges of this August Constitutional Court made. And may I just read those four lines, my Lord, on page 14, paragraph 144. The purpose of elevating certain rights to the stature of guaranteed fundamental rights is to insulate their exercise from the disdain of majorities, whether legislative or popular. The guarantee of constitutional rights does not depend upon their exercise being favorably regarded by majoritarian opinion. And my lords, when Dr. Ambedkar was confronted with exactly this question, whether Indian society was ready for the reform that is the Hindu code, and what about a majority, and how does a majority feel? He said this. He said that it is not a question of numbers. It is not a question of majorities and minorities. It is a question of conscience. I would submit, my lords, that by insulating fundamental rights from the whims and vagaries of majorities and minorities, this constitutional court has created a constitutional principle that Dr. Ambedkar called conscience. My lords have called insulating their exercise from the disdain of majority. From 1951 to Puttuswami in 2017, from Dr. Ambedkar to Puttuswami in 2017, the thread of conscience 
being the test for fundamental rights is a haloed constitutional principle. The chairperson of the drafting committee felt so, my lords have felt so, that there is certain basic rights that are not subject to the whims and vagaries of either a legislature that does not create that positive enactment, which the Supreme Court of the United States in Obergfell said that that constitutional conversation is a continuing one. Dr. Guruswami, you are right in asserting that marriage itself is a bouquet of rights. And you identify three, gratuity, provident oh. fund, pension, actually it doesn't stop at that at all. I think the most important social security which is provided to spouses between each other, yes, my Lord. apart from of course the spousal comfort and uh, consortium, is your entitlement upon the death of a spouse, yes. say in the case of a motor accident or natural death. Yes. yes. Now, if we declare, as you say, using the SMA, that you know, substitute the word spouse for uh, husband and wife or substitute person for man and woman. For the moment, you know, take it for the granted, that's, that, that, that's a simple act of uh, reading up or reading down the statute. But then can we stop at that today? Can we stop at that and say that, look, we'll go so far and no further. What happens, suppose there are two Hindu women who have then married, I or there are two Hindu men who have married, and you have one of them dies. Can the court today then say that we will not go into what will happen, suppose, in the case of interstice? Because there the Hindu Succession Act says, in the event of a Hindu male dying interstate, property will devolve in the following manner. But there's a clear distinction between what a woman will get, what a man will get. When a woman dies interstate, there's a different line of succession. Yes, how does the court today, if we have to go into this, how does the court avoid getting into other issues which are necessarily intrinsically interlinked to what you are arguing? Lord, See, so long as you are dealing with broader issues like dignity, the right to family life, that marriage is an essence of human dignity, that people are not trying to denigrate the institution of marriage, but trying to benefit from the institution of marriage. Why should we be confined only to heterosexual couples? That's conceptually the easier terrain for the court to cross. The difficulty is, once you cross the terrain, there's no stopping then. The court necessarily has to... Just a follow-up question. I think what I would also echo what the Chief Justice is saying. My Lord. The constitutional or the theoretical underpinnings of your, your argument and uh, your predecessors is easily comprehensible and let's say that's uh i mean one can it's an achievable target as long as we confine ourselves to that but if we were to take adopt, adopt the course that you were asking us to necessarily one one of the important consequences and i'm not highlighting this as the only which is what the chief justice actually alluded to is that the provision makes a distinction between personal laws and personal laws. And then which means that a spouse who is not recognized in personal law, but who is, who is treated as a spouse according to our interpretation, will actually lose out in the event of an unforeseen unnatural death. Let's say where, you, where, where, where one of the, spou the spouses have, neither of the spouses have made any testamentary bequest. In such a case, when intestacy follows, the surviving spouse is left with nothing, perhaps even the children. Because then the personal laws of succession apply at least in the case of four or five communities. According to this very enactment. Yes. My Lord, so may I quickly take you to page 35 of my submissions? where we have a series of laws that differently impact same-sex and opposite-sex couples. And, and, and the reason why I'm showing my lords this, and this is in tandem with an extra one. 
page 74 of the submissions to 102. This is an exhaustive list. Now, the reason why I'm showing my lords this is my lord justice, but in yes. principle, in principle, my lord, I already have the principal protection of the courts. I have Puttuswami and I have Johar. That's exactly the point. Yes, oh, yeah. but, but my lords, the problem with being protected in principle is that principle is not enough for the business of life. We entirely agree with you. There's no doubt about it, Dr. Guruswami. You're absolutely yeah. right. You're spot on. I mean, that's exactly the cause of worry for us also. Death, See, my lord. Uh, Declaration is the first step. The second step would be some illustrative list, like the list we have provided, using workability, which we've also provided. Then the rest will follow, my lords, as it has Sorry, always Dr. followed. Dr. Guruswami, just to play the spoiler here, yes, how sir. many times are we to play the follow-up? That is what worries us. My lords. Because if we are not to get into this, just because it suits the certain certain cases and that's a thorny issue aren't we avoiding it my lord's our yes. job is to look at the workability not only of what you're showing as illustratively yes what you have next and some of you have originally next is the correct thing which is virtually a reenactment of those provisions <laughs> forget re, re reading into or reading up or reading down we are virtually reenacting, which is, you know, that major, the hard task you're saying we will leave it later. How many more litigations are we going to face? Of course, you are not, you can't answer that. But we have to answer it or many courts will have to answer it. So well, is this our job? Ultimately, we'll come, come back to the same point. Well, uh, you know, all these statutes which you have referred to, you have given us 35 examples of the statutes. All these statutes confer social welfare benefits on certain persons, certain categories of persons, right? Uh, upon the wife of a deceased employee, on the husband of a deceased uh, woman employee, so on and so forth, like maternity benefits, provident fund, pension, income tax. So these statutes in that sense are also exclusionary. They define who will get the benefit, right? Now, by accepting your submission, we are going to say that for the purposes of these statutes, these benefits must primarily devolve on the spouse of a same-sex couple, which necessarily means that we are excluding a category of beneficiaries who the statutes otherwise statute otherwise contemplates. My lords, may I respectfully submit, my lords? that I am not asking so for that. So essentially what we are doing is, in this process, by conferring benefits on a particular category of persons, the court is necessarily giving a value judgment of who will be excluded from receiving that benefit by, inter by interposing somebody who is going to get benefit under that statute. My lords, may I answer, my lords, uh, with just taking any example from this table? Any example, my lords. But Maybe take any a, example. Take your Provident yes, Fund Act. Yes, my lords. Take the Payment of Gratuity Act. Yes, my lords. The Payment of Gratuity Act, my lords, that's the first in, in, my, in, in my table, the Payment of Gratuity Act 1972. If my lords, please just turn to page 30. Simple example. If, a, if an employee dies without having, say a single employee dies, not married at all, forget the same sex, the Gratuity Act will define or the law of succession will define who will get who will be entitled to those benefits right yes my lords and it only now by saying that that benefit which is contemplated under the payment of gratuity act should be given to the same sex spouse of that particular employee we necessarily mm -hmm. exclude employees who would be the beneficiaries who would otherwise be entitled to under the act now, the only point which we are putting to you is this: Does this not, therefore, intervene? Does not does this not raise um, some issue of statutory value judgment? My lords, mm -hmm. may I just say this, my lords? If if we just look at the term sex, these are you know these three. because now that we get into follow my lords. So you know the broader canvas, Puttaswami, Johar. We've now come a far, long, long, long way ahead from there. You need not really labour that. 
no my lord sir question is this is now what is the uh, yes, this is now the worrying uh, may i just like, not the jurisprudence to the grad jurisprudence on 21 is the, the least my bit of a ground yes, sir i won't be touching it my lords may i take you my lords back to the gratuity act this is page dr melika gurusani please see that's the reason we began by saying that we will one way or the rule on the view you want to be adopted of a status of a marriage and certain whatever consequential benefits arise point 4 of mr mukul rodgi's argument i bow down my lords beyond that <laughs> when you exactly. get into the nitty gritty and i agree with the chief justice it become very complicated exercise and it include it is a inclusive methodology and exclusive methodology both creating different rights how can all these scenarios are the complete uh, painting if i would say be painted in advance that's a difficult exercise my lords most of the examples that are given in the submissions really involve only a re understanding of the marital relationship that's it because all of them the gratuity act the provident fund act says the benefit goes to the surviving spouse so here the technical leap that needs to be made is not much my lord it is only about who can be married the moment we are read into the sma then these statutory requirements are satisfied because for instance the gratuity access can only nominate his oblique her family members as a nominee and any nomination outside the family is void the explanation says married children these are the nominations so my lords all that we would humbly request there is just a reading in to who can marry the moment we are read into the sma then these problems dissipate and that reading into the sma is a declaration by my lords then in dr. all dr. these statutes dr guru swami may i my lord my lord bring to your attention at section 21a which is very specific and it is within the SA, uh, you know sma because if we have to make some uh, provision of reading in under that act we have to make it consistent with the other provisions now section 21a is a departure it was brought in in 1976 to preserve the application of personal laws in the case of these four categories hindus buddhists sikh or jains my lord means that you revert to your personal law then that brings you back there is no there is no question of your shying away from this and like dr singh we fairly argued about section 27 certain uh, i think mr rothi argued about other provisions the remit of this is very clear that you will revert to personal law and in the case now as you say the business of life has to go on on an every day basis now we as argue and do we declare that man is includes woman or whatever and we say spouse what happens is what could happen is if tomorrow somebody dies due to an unforeseen circumstance like a an accident if it is an accident there is no intestate test there is no testamentary you know disposition and let's say assume there is no will then necessarily revert you will revert to the hindu marriage act hindu succession act and the order of succession will have to be in accordance with that the surviving spouse will be deprived so we will have to make sense of this and i'm i'm drawing this to your attention because even if we accept your argument about section 4 all this will immediately stand up we 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 may or not may not go into other statutes but certainly internal sense of this enactment is necessary my lords there will need to necessarily be internal coherence there is no way that i i would be able to argue out of that there is your my lords will have a declaration that, that my respectful submission there would be a declaration there would be some illustrations and most civil law would be covered by that declaration there will be situations like 21a and those will follow my lords and that is the intention of the special marriage act my lords that it follows in this way and we will not be exempt from that there is no category of citizens 
that will not have to necessarily follow how the Special Marriage Act devolves in all its parts. It is one law for all, my lords. You know, Dr. Guruswami, before the personal law was codified by the Hindu Code Bill in 1956, and then you had various other acts also which were, were enacted, marriage, adoption, these were two areas which was, and in fact, interstice as well, which were all governed by First, by, by convention, by custom, yes. and by the uncodified Hindu law for that matter. Yes, Manoj. Therefore, there was the uncodified Hindu personal law, the Mitakshara. Yes, the Now, what the Hindu code bills did in 1956 was to bring about a codification of this. Now, the Special Marriage Act was in that sense an exception. It carved out an exception because it, it professed to be neutral to religion the idea was to to encourage or to at least have a legislative framework for intra religious intra inter inter religious inter inter caste marriages so on and so forth so what it did essentially was to carve out an exception from the general principle that marriage interstice adoption all matters which fall now within the ambit of entry 5 of list 3 were governed by your personal law prior to the codification by the uncodified uh, Hindu law. Now, what we are therefore, you know, even the argument, I mean, I'm, this is something which you need to also reflect on, we need to reflect on. The argument that we confine it only to the Special Marriage Act is therefore this, that you create for same-sex couples a non-religious, right, am I right? A non-religious framework for marriage and then whatever follows with it. So A, there's a value judgment in that, that the court will not give this benefit to those people who still say that, well, I assert myself, I assert my right to stay within the fold of my religion. This is for those who are governed by the secular law, namely the Special Marriage Act. Second, then even the Special Marriage Act, in the case of these four communities, Hindu, Jains, Buddhists and Sikhs. and Sikhs takes you back. The original act is it to state the moment you apply the Special Marriage Act, you are ousted from your family. The moment there is a severance from your family, you lose all the benefits of being a member of the family. You cease to be a co-partner in the family. This now 21A tells you that when you go back, this will not involve a severance from the family. Yes. Yes. So, which indicates therefore that even in respect of a marriage which is governed by the Special Marriage Act, all other incidents of the marriage are governed by your own personal law. And your personal law is intrinsically religious based. Whether it is in the case of the Hindu subject to the social reform which was brought about, which was permissible under Article 25, or in the case of Muslims, or in the case of Parsis, Zoroastrians. It has to follow, my lords. Quite right. Therefore, there is, there, is no, there, is, there is no denying or getting over the link between all, Even the Special all. Marriage Act and personal law. Not at all, my lords. There is no, you know, as, as litigators, we may be seamstresses of arguments, my lords, between judgments, articles, but there is no getting away from this. I, I am not mm -hmm. trying to say that thus far and no further. I am not trying to say separate but equal. Uh, I would never say that. This will be the natural flow for now. <laughs> We are suggesting interpretive techniques, a declaration, a broad definition. That is what we are suggesting. In the converse, all that is can't ever be confined only to the Special Marriage Act. It my, has to go beyond the Special Marriage Act. My 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 substituted submission. Simple point: the income tax officer will say, "What am I supposed to do in respect of a gift by a spouse to another spouse?" It will follow, my lords. It will absolutely follow. Therefore, we also had an HMA petition. It will absolutely follow. Oh, I will not shy away from Tommy, that. What your, your message is, you say this. And brace up for more litigation. My lords, it's 
uh, because we don't believe parliament is going to enact anything my no. lord and and i don't believe either as my lord saw on day 1 we don't i didn't we, say we no my lord yeah. we don't believe my lord as uh, in yes i is here not, my lord not, not, not my lord no Sorry. no my lord we I cannot not suggest that just in the same vein then yes. are we to speak for the entire are you to speak for the entire community of uh, 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 the the people who are before us are you truly representative there may be diversities there are diverse Certainly, my lords we there, there are, are only 19 petitions before my lords preserve. there may be unheard voices who may want to preserve their way of life their their traditions i'm not i'm not talking of the general population i'm talking yes. of in your the communities that you represent that they do not want a break from their traditions and the yet the moment, moment we secularize this and go one step further we assimilate this and constitutionalize it as it were we are, we are in denial of their rights my lords respectfully those who wish to participate in this you know new definition of the institution may participate those who do not wish to participate will not participate even today many opposite sex couples opt for a live in relationship even though they have the benefit of marriage but they will not participate not because they don't want to participate but they will not participate for the reason my, that they do not want that, to participate at the cost of forsaking their yes my their lord connects with their religious communities right that is also a choice linkages. that they is they don't want to break point. those linkages to apply to opposite people and hindus in same manner is a part of that yours to do my lords all our submission on 21a is that we implore this court that the special marriage act as it is should apply equally to same sex and opposite sex couples now those who choose to opt in those who choose to opt out those rights are retained for whatever reason it may be a matter of faith it may be a matter of way of life those choices are actively exercised constantly by same sex and opposite sex couples but the ability to have that choice is an act of constitutional principle and 21a gives all couples that choice opposite sex and hopefully in future same sex 21a recognizes that choice is being exercised by opposite sex couples on a constant basis we don't ask for anything more than that my lords and i bow down my my lord justice but i appreciate the point you're making that within the community as well there may be those who do not want to exercise this choice and that is valid principle under inclusion inclusion under inclusion under inclusion is a legislative device which is open to the legislature and we uphold we uphold under inclusive classification saying that parliament or the state legislature does not have to legislate on everything to legislate on something that's the principle of under inclusive classification but that's very different from judicial review judicial review is never by its nature under inclusive my lords Ju judicial review is declaratory and applies across the spectrum my lords i to whoever I, falls within the sweep of the declaration respectfully then say no. two things both in alternative one so both in terms dr guruswami both in terms of how we will have to craft such a solution and in more fundamental philosophical grounds based on the on, on jurisprudence on judicial review principles there is a lot of thinking to be done in this uh, in this matter my lords your lordships have a burden here there is no question we all that. all that we are what you can make out this my lady out far and no further my lords my lady the that, that is something which is really engaging us for you to say that the sma be brought in line in such a manner that we should read spouse where it's husband and wife and person where it is a man and woman so far so good but there's something more to it certainly 
this is a legal and constitutional journey there is no question my lady like we have thus far made a journey from the days of suresh kaushal Okay.